We have five very popular new guys here. The Backstreet Boys, brand new group, new heartthrobs. Uh -huh. Oh my God, we're back again. Thousands of screaming fans packing the stadium tonight. This group is very popular with young girls. They have sold over 10 million records. Wake up, not know who you woke up with, where you were at, scratches on your body, and try to remember what happened that night. Lou Pearlman. What he does is take teenage boys and turn them into rich, famous pop music stars. His musical sons used to call him Big Papa. Now they call him a thief and a con man. That was probably one of the lowest points in my life. Nick Carter was abusing drugs and alcohol so seriously that it actually led to a buildup of toxins in his heart. Put down the 7-Up. Uh, of course, it's on camera, and obviously they don't drink this too. Yes, 7-Up, true. It's also called the sudden death syndrome. And they actually raised me in a lot of ways. You were a guardian. I was his guardian. You were a guardian. little legal guardian. Welcome to BJ Investigates, a show I just created and might never do again. It's hard to keep track of what I talked about in the last episode. What was it? Probably something about, uh, it was the Britney Industrial Complex. Y'all go watch that. Thank you very much. In today's episode, we're going to still stay a little bit along those same veins, but we're going to go back even a little bit further. And today we're going to talk about the most successful, highest selling boy band of all time. As usual, and it should really go without saying, please do not contact anyone in this video, send them hate or love or anything else. To be honest, just don't don't contact anybody as a result of this video. The purpose of this video is to report on things that are out in the public and give my commentary. This is not legal advice, this is my opinion. This is my opinion, thank you. All facts are alleged, innocent till proven guilty. The boy band model goes back a really long time. Take five boys, put them in a band, girls will go crazy, and the five part harmonies are catchy and nice to sing along to. All the way back to the 50s, we have Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers. The 60s and 70s would bring us bands like The Beatles and Jackson 5. The 80s and 90s would bring us bands like Menudo, New Edition, and ultimately New Kids on the Block. Up until that point, every new generation of boy band outperformed the last. But no boy band in history has ever held a candle to the massive monumental success of the Backstreet Boys. The band was conceptualized in 1992 by an entrepreneur named Lou Pearlman. And because of the band's success, many referred to them as the blueprint for modern day boy bands. In some ways, they're right. But what many people don't know is that Lou Pearlman didn't just stumble his way into accidental success with the Backstreet Boys. He worked hand in hand, side by side, with a powerful team of industry insiders for years to meticulously curate the image, sound, and attitude of the boys, grooming and shaping them into the megalithic pop idols they would become. The Backstreet Boys hadn't even reached the height of their fame and success before Lou began curating his next project, NSYNC. And he didn't stop there either. Through his company, Transatlantic Records, Lou created and managed more than a half dozen boy bands over the years, all of them based off a very specific and effective formula. According to a 1999 article published by CBS News entitled The Idol Maker, the winning formula is the following. A young one, a cute one, a sensitive one, a jokester, a bad boy, and the older hunk, all between the ages of 12 and 20. Never mind the fact that that's actually six and not five, but maybe one is supposed to cross over. I really don't know. What are you looking for? You need to have the young kid that definitely has a cute look that the young girls are looking for. Older guy has to have that older image. It's great to have somebody Latino who gives an extra flavor to it. Stars well, one guy has to have that GQ look. When the boy band craze began to dwindle, Lou took advantage of the public's new interest in reality TV competition shows, and he created a show called Making the Band to create another boy band to add to his collection. Hey, all you singers out there, Lou Pearlman, the mastermind behind such bands as LFO, NSYNC, and the Backstreet Boys, is looking for five talented young men to form a new band. The first time I ever saw Lou Pearlman was when I was auditioning for Making the Band in Vegas. He comes walking out of the auditioning room 
room. Bobby Ray's like, this, you know, that's Lou Pearlman, like, as he walks by. And this guy is the guy pioneering music on the radio right now. From Boston. Boston, huh? Yeah. How old are you? I'm 19. <laughs> Lou Pearlman could, on a whim, change anyone's life here. <laughs> You guys are going to be one of the 25 guys coming oh. out to Orlando, and uh, then we'll go from there to the final... Now, Lou would only appear on that show for a season before handing off the reins to P. Diddy. We did talk about that a few episodes ago, but the entirety of the making the band thing is a story for another day. Anyway, whenever he was making all these boy bands, Lou did not work alone. He was part of a multiplayer team. And the most important players on that team, whenever it came to setting up the Backstreet Boys in the early 90s, were Johnny and Donna Wright, a husband and wife management duo. And this was hardly Johnny and Donna's first rodeo when it came to boy bands. They had also worked with another massively, monumentally successful boy band called New Kids on the Block. Former New Kids on the Block road managers Johnny Wright and his then wife Donna, they think the boys have potential. Johnny and Donna came down and they helped me manage the group. So this is Johnny Wright, production manager and voice of the New Kids. The early 1990s, New Kids on the Block were the biggest thing in the world. They were everywhere. They were dolls. They were towels. They were lunch boxes. They played the Super Bowl halftime show. But it was the success of New Kids that really caught Lou's attention. In 1991, Forbes magazine said New Kids made more money than Madonna and Michael Jackson. I was invited to come down to one of the shows. All the screaming. I was like, my God. I mean, not to mention, okay, there's a tinkle to the cash register, no question about it. Johnny Wright had experienced success, obviously, as a tour manager for the New Kids on the Block, and Lou was particularly impressed with Johnny's extensive knowledge of how the whole teen market operated. The sacrifice that these kids have to go through as teenagers to do what they do. So Johnny and Donna set up camp with Lou Pearlman and Transcontinental Records, and they began operating as a three-pronged team of mass promotion. Basically, Lou Pearlman would do the scouting and the business operations, Johnny would handle the management, and Donna would deal directly with the artists. Kind of like a den mother. Not a babysitter. Um, I like to call it a den mother. Creating an assumed family tree, beneath which all would succeed, or so they thought. Pearlman brought in new kids veterans, Donna and Johnny Wright, to run the day-to-day -day business. I was a mother, I was a nurse, I was a counselor. I, I was everything. Girlfriend problems, parent problems. Donna and Johnny essentially lived with the boys. They were a lot of fun. I mean, we used to roll around on the bus and the tour buses and uh, we played pranks on each other and Nick gave me some kind of uh, gum one day. Oh no. It's my uh, girlfriend, Azra. Uh, it was called Fish Guts. That's terrible. Okay. By the time that Johnny and Donna had agreed to work with Lou Pearlman, Lou had already actually auditioned and chosen the members of the band. Now there's a bunch of videos all over YouTube that'll tell you how each and every individual person joined the band, but we're just gonna give a really brief TLDR right here. I also just wanna give a really brief disclaimer. Y'all know I can't get through one single video without giving at least a few mandatory disclaimers. But the disclaimer is there's a few different versions of these stories. I'm doing my best to kind of distill them and find the common denominators. I'll point it out where some of the versions are different, but there are a few different versions. So the story goes that Lou Pearlman, who was an entrepreneur, an accountant by trade, he had made his fortune in the private charter industry. So he was flying private planes, which sounds a little bit too close for comfort to what we know is going on on these private planes back in the 90s, but that's a story for maybe never. Anyway, so Lou was chartering these private planes. I don't know if he was the pilot or what, but at some point he began to charter out his planes to famous rock musicians and bands. One such band was the one we mentioned earlier, New Kids on the Block. So Lou gets invited to go to a New Kids on the Block concert. And while he's there, he reports hearing the girls screaming, seeing everyone get so excited and lose their minds. And most importantly, I think to Lou, he saw that these girls were buying every single item of merchandise that the new kids on the block were selling. So Lou decides he can do that. He can put a band together like that and he basically immediately starts to put out a bunch of advertisements in order to get people to audition for his band. The first person to audition was AJ McLean. He was a singer, he could dance, and he auditioned for Lou in Lou's living room. 
He immediately got the role and he was the first member of the Backstreet Boys. Now at this point, remember, boy bands were not new. They have been around since literally, I don't know, 1950 with Frankie Lyman and the teenagers and probably even before that. But Lou was kind of trying to essentially just emulate what he had seen work in the past. And there's been boy bands in the past, a ton of them. So Lou not only was trying to build the formula of the boy bands with, you know, the cute one, the old one, whatever. He also specifically had a number of members in mind because he wanted a five part harmony. So he was really looking for five boys. He had AJ and he kept auditioning more boys. The next person to audition for the band was none other than Nick Carter. Now he auditioned in Lou's blimp hanger for some reason and he sang like a bridge over troubled water. Apparently it was really good and so he was the next member. Auditions kept rolling in and Lou did audition many, many boys in his blimp hanger, but the only one that he really saw any promise in other than Nick was Howie. Unfortunately for Lou, he was unable to fill those other two spots to round out his five-part harmony, but he did hit the ground running and have AJ, Nick, and Howie just start performing and start making videos. My mom had always suggested to me, you know, a while back ago when I was in high school, you know, why don't you put like a group together? Um, you know, maybe try to form your own band. And there was, there was other groups that were out at the time, like new kids and stuff like that. And I was just like, well, I wasn't really sure if that group was really like the right type of scene for me. I've known Howie for about 10 years. Him and I met at a thing called the Latin Carnival back in Orlando, which is for all the Latino talent in all of Orlando. And both Howie and I are both Latin, so we entered the contest and I did a 45 minute one man show and I beat Howie. And then we kept seeing Nick and the, you know, the, the uh, three of us kind of vibed, you know, and we became really good friends. Started singing together off and on, you know, started a little trio and got signed to, you know, small independent label back in Orlando. But yeah, he hit the ground running. He had them start working together, start dancing, start singing, whatever. But he was still on the lookout for those fourth and fifth members because he really wanted five. After a while, Lou began to start to look elsewhere outside of these newspaper auditions in order to fill the fourth and fifth spots because he was really set on this five-part harmony. So he kind of started to scout. Now, the exact specific circumstances surrounding how exactly Lou learned about the next member, Kevin, it's a little bit disputed on the record. There's some versions of the story that say that Lou Pearlman's limo driver knew Kevin, but there are other versions of the story that say that Lou actually scouted Kevin from a Disney Parks parade because Kevin was working there as Aladdin at the time. I guess it's possible both stories are true, that the limo driver knew Kevin and told Lou to go and watch him in the parade, but I really don't know. Nevertheless, Kevin was the next member of the band and he was about 10 years older than the youngest member, Nick Carter. Nick was undeniably, obviously the cute one. And even though he was the youngest of the other members so far, he really did stand out with a lot of showmanship and charisma. So with one more spot to fill, they're still on the lookout and Kevin, the most recent member, the guy who was playing Aladdin at the Disney parks, he told Lou that he had just the right person to fill the spot and it happened to be his cousin, Brian, who was living in Kentucky. Lou got the boys all together, all five of them for the first time and had them sing. And the way that it's reported by pretty much all of them is that it was really actually very good. The boys, the boys sang really well together. They performed well together and their chemistry looked good and they were cute and whatever. So it looked like the Backstreet Boys was ready to go. Now, Lou Pearlman himself pretty much wrote the first songs that the boys would sing. A lot of people old. in the U.S. didn't get our original, very first uh, Backstreet Boys album because it was released in Europe. And, you know, we did like a song called Boys Will Be Boys or... <laughs> if you want to be a good girl, I go anywhere for you. Uh, if you want to be a good girl, good girl, get you a bad boy. That's oh, stupid. That's the stupidest song. I didn't want to sing on it. All right. But for all intents and purposes, Lou was basically trying to make a knockoff New Kids on the Block 
but that could actually sing. Because apparently the rumor was the new kids on the block couldn't really sing live. They were lip syncing. So Lou was like, all right, fine. I'll put together a band that's basically just exactly like new kids on the block because they were still so popular at the time. But I'm going to have it to where my band can actually sing. So Lou put a lot of effort up front into making sure that the boys actually had really good voices and that they were harmonizing well together because he wanted to be able to show that they could sing live, which is what was going to set them apart from new kids on the block. In retrospect, as somebody in the future looking back on the past, it's really easy to kind of starkly distinguish New Kids on the Block from the boy bands that would follow, including Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, LFO, O-Town. They're very, very different. New Kids on the Block was kind of like tough, leather jackets, like sort of giving a little bit like 80s vibes, but Backstreet Boys started out exactly like that. Their very first public performance ever was a live performance on the local news, and they were basically dressed just like new kids on the block, and even the way that they were saying their names and stuff. I'm Howie D. I'm Nikki C. Hey, uh, we rock. No, what's that? The mic. Kevin. Kevin who? Howie D. Nikki C. Actually, Nick Carter. Hand and uh, what are you guys planning on uh, doing tonight? Uh, how, how many songs are you going to sing? We're going to sing two, two and a half. half. Two and a half songs. Why the half? It's kind of like still sort of trying to play off of that tough guy Italian thing that the new kids on the block were running with. Here we are with the Backstreet Boys. I think this was the guy here that they wanted the most. I don't know why. Take it home, Nikki. The ladies just like you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Let's party. Turn it, fuck you. Kick it. But that wasn't the only evidence of that. There was also the fact that the news anchors were kind of introducing them as the new new kids on the block. And the news anchor himself who was interviewing them had also said, you're nothing like those other kids, those other other boy, but we're not gonna mention them. And like later that. we'll introduce you to a new singing sensation. The next legends maybe, who could, who could be the new kids, the new new kids on the block? Maybe we had to have Tom say that. <laughs> It's probably easy in retrospect to look back and think that they were comparing Backstreet Boys to NSYNC, but NSYNC was like years in the future. It hadn't even been thought of or conceived yet. So Lou was legitimately just trying to make a clone of new kids on the block in order to make money. Well, the boys do that performance and then Lou lines them up to do another performance at SeaWorld for grad night in 1993. <laughs> So Lou has those performances filmed. He might've even filmed them himself, but whatever the case may be, he sends the video recordings of those performances around to a bunch of different scouts, talent managers, labels, whoever would really watch. And one of the people he sent that to was Johnny Wright. Why did he send it to Johnny Wright? Well, as you already learned, Johnny Wright was the road manager for New Kids on the Block. So here you have Lou Pearlman making a New Kids on the Block clone that can actually sing a little bit better or whatever live and then he sends the tapes of their performances to Johnny Wright the new kids on the block road manager I guess Johnny and Donna liked what they saw and decided that maybe they could make something of this new band so now they have Johnny and Donna on board and Lou is there as well and they're this three-prong management team Lou's doing the scouting and the managing Donna is the den mother working directly with the boys I felt that I gave birth to this group, and uh, uh, yeah. that's okay. And Johnny is bringing in all of his industry knowledge. Their goal at that point was to get the backing of a major label. So the next big PR push was a tour of high schools. They would do three shows a day in high school gyms and the girls were apparently going crazy. Their work ethic was really incredible. I mean, they were working and they were young children. So we would go around to like middle schools, high schools, gymnasiums, yeah. auditoriums, and perform music that nobody had ever heard. Um, we we did covers yet. too. Nick was, I think, 12 years old whenever this all started. And Nick had also been offered a contract with the Mickey Mouse Club, and he was gonna be in the same exact season as Britney, Justin, Christina, Ryan Gosling, all those people. But Nick turned down the Mickey Mouse Club contract in order to be a Backstreet Boy. 
So they're working, they're training, they're PR pushing, they're sweating in the hot sun in the warehouse, all of that. At that point, Lou is calling the boot camp that they're all going through a finishing school or something. I, I really don't know. It's basically another version of the flavor camp that P. Diddy did run. And I've made some connections through all these labels and stuff. But if I put it all in one video, it's going to be nine hours long and y'all's minds are going to explode. So we're going to have to do it piece by piece. But we did make a video on P. Diddy, like I said. So go and watch that because all of this web is going to come tangling back together in the next few videos. So the boys are training at Lou Pearl version of Flavor Camp and they took every radio interview. They took every commercial. They did some cheesy, silly stuff in the beginning. It just says that you, the Backstreet Boys, agreed to appear at a Burger King yada yada. And what's the yada yada? A little commercial. Forget it. We don't do commercials. Not our style, man. We wouldn't even do this for a lifetime supply of free Whoppers. But they were really working their butts off. All the while, Lou and Johnny and Donna are sending off these interviews and the ways the girls are reacting and all of these tapes and video recordings and stuff to major record labels. Really, nobody wanted to sign them. Nobody really wanted to sign the Backstreet Boys. I think it was just they were too close to New Kids on the Block. And at that time, it was like reports in the news, like New Kids on the Block are not kids anymore. They're getting old or whatever. There was really a need for something fresh and brand new, not just the cloning of the new kids on the block. So finally, two years after Lou created and conceptualized this band, the year 1994, they finally do get a yes. And that is from a record company called Jive. And this is the first place where I personally noticed things were definitely already weird. There is a video out and about, has a hundred more thousand views, and it's essentially a home movie of the boys celebrating their Jive record contract. But it's kind of a joint party. It's a celebration for their record contract, but it also seemingly happens to be an anniversary party for Johnny and Donna. And in and of itself, who cares? You can have a joint party. That's not that big of a deal, especially whenever Johnny Wright and Donna are two of the three-prong management team and whatever. That's not really the weird part. The weird part is that the Backstreet Boys are obviously drunk. And I don't think a single one of them was over 21 years old at the time. Maybe Kevin might have been. But they're all not only drinking, they're actively, obviously drunk. Nick is hiccuping. They're acting like they're gonna throw each other in the pool. And then someone even mentions it whenever Lou Pearlman then wants them to do an acapella performance for whatever reason by the pool. He says, put your seven up down. And they're holding like cocktail glasses. Okay, you can celebrate. Now put down the uh, seven up. <laughs> and someone even behind the camera laughs and it's like, seven up. And Lou is like, yeah, because it's on camera and these guys obviously don't drink because they are with the students against drunk driving. <laughs> yeah. Because it's on camera and obviously they don't drink. There's two yes. against them. Seven up. And the person behind the camera is like, oh, oh, right, right, yeah, seven up. And they're all laughing. And it's like, they're obviously drinking, they're obviously drunk. We're not talking about 19 or 20 year old kids, y'all. One of them's 13, one of them's 14. I think the image that they have to give off is something of sincerity, something that shows their true feelings about life, about what they'd like to see for themselves and growing up in their generation. And to help show our younger generation that it's okay to be cool and not have to do drugs, say no to uh, alcohol. Then the two older ones are dressing up like a clown and a woman clown and, and he's tucking up his you know what with some duct tape and putting on a wig and out there and it's like it doesn't actually look like he's particularly comfortable. I don't really know what the context is of them dressing up like a woman and a clown. But there's even a caption on it from Kevin at some point that's like we feel so stupid. I feel so stupid or something. And he's like get this stupid wig off me in the captions. It does not appear to me as if this was something that these two Backstreet Boys like volunteered necessarily to do or even why they're necessarily why they're doing it but they come out and they do a little some type of performance as a clown and a woman and it goes on forever because they're not enjoying it later in the night they're huffing helium out of balloons which is a normal kid thing to do hi uh, I'm Kevin this is Brian we're two yes. members of the Backstreet Boys yeah uh, we're cousins and we're, we're from, from Kentucky, Kentucky. <laughs> and uh, 
and there's no adults around while they're doing that so i mean it is kind of bad for your brain i would not suggest anybody try that at home but that in and of itself isn't necessarily bad but what is bad is that they were all obviously drunk some of them were barely teenagers and there's all this grab ass and i'm not sure all their parents were there or not maybe they were i really don't know so sometime right around that same time in 1994 the backstreet boys go back for their second grad night performance at sea world there's some pretty alarming stuff that goes on in that video as well. And again, this is a publicly available video that's been around for years and years. I'm frankly surprised no one's ever brought this stuff up before. I'm not even sure if I can actually show on this video all the things that Nick Carter was doing on this tour bus after the performance, but suffice it to say, he was doing the rehearsals and everything in this red tank top. Then they finish their performance, they get back on the tour bus, they all somehow now have suits on. I'm really not sure what that's all about, but Nick was doing some pretty explicit, implicit gestures. And again, I mean, the kid's probably 13, 14 years old at this point. It is normal behaviors for a kid but it just kind of brought it to my mind how young Nick Carter really was compared to the older people in the band and compared to these adults that he was hanging out with at parties. I can imagine that he was, you know, groomed at least in the way where he was kind of forced to be an adult at an extremely young age. He was doing these auditions at least by the time he was 11, probably earlier. Now, there was also a five-year age gap between Nick and his bandmate, Brian. That was the one who came from Kentucky. He was the last one to join the band or whatever. And that brings me to like kind of the main point of this video. According to several separate sources, Nick was in a legal guardianship while he was on tour and while they were on the road. And his parents were not at all times his legal guardians. According to these sources, Brian Luttrell was Nick Carter's guardian on the road. Brian Luttrell was only five years older than Nick Carter. He's gonna be staying with me tonight. Yeah? Yeah, because uh, I'm his guardian. You're not my guardian. I'm his big brother and I'm gonna knock him out. He brought it up to my attention when I was 14. 13. I was 13. Uh, my parents had signed over uh, guardianship to him. So he was actually raising me on the road at like 13, 14 years old. So Nick would have been 13 years old and an 18 year old who was also his bandmate would have been his guardian. I enjoyed it. So in and of itself, that's already a little bit disturbing because what we know about the business structure of the band is that all five members of the band were equal owners. They were kind of like owners of the name and likeness of the band, but so was Lou Pearlman. He installed himself as the sixth member of the Backstreet Boys legally. But the Lou Pearlman section is a story for another day, or maybe I'll never tell that story. Y'all should go watch the boy band con. My point of bringing up the business structure of the Backstreet Boys is not even to talk about the Lou Pearlman thing. It's to talk about the financial and legal conflicts of interest that somebody like Brian would have had. For example, if Brian is an equal member of the Backstreet Boys and so is Nick, and Nick wants to, for example, leave, or let's say Nick, as we now ended up finding out on the road, Nick did become addicted to drugs and alcohol and things like that. The best thing for Nick as a person would be probably to leave tour. But the best thing for Brian would be if Nick didn't leave the tour because then Nick would be taking money away from the Backstreet Boys. Everybody knew Nick was a huge part of why girls went to the show. Not all girls, everybody had their own favorites. But you can imagine the conflict of interest for somebody like Brian if he was indeed, in fact, the legal guardian of Nick, he would have had a huge conflict. Do you do what's in the best interest of Nick or do you do what's in the best interest of your own financial gain if it comes down to having to make that decision and then putting on top of the fact he became the guardian at like barely 18 years old. Now for what it's worth, I did go to the Hillsborough County Court website and I tried to get the guardianship documents from Nick's guardianship. I was able to find the docket entries and I was able to procure three of the documents. But for some reason that really doesn't make any sense at all to me, the file has been destroyed pursuant to some, I don't know, record. I really don't know why they destroyed the file of Nick Carter's guardianship. It seems like something that historians and people in the future, even after all of us are gone, are gonna wanna look back on and see what actually happened. But long story short, I was unable to confirm that Brian was ever the legal guardian of Nick. The people that it looks like were Nick's guardians were his parents. So I don't know if he signed over a separate agreement, maybe with Jive or maybe with someone else signing over their guardianship outside of court, or maybe they did it inside of court and 
it's just one of those documents I was unable to find. But it was reported publicly, and it does seem to be the case that Nick and Brian both still to this day believe that Brian was in fact Nick's legal guardian. So that raises a whole nother host of issues, a whole nother host of questions. One of those issues is that the boys were known to fight with one another. There was not only intense competition with NSYNC, where they were all under all this pressure, where they were trying to compete with NSYNC all the time. There was also immense pressure within the group to all be kind of like Lou Pearlman's favorite. Most of the boys in most of Lou Pearlman's bands didn't have active fathers, and some of them didn't have fathers at all. So Lou kind of took on this fatherly type of role, and he even had the boys call him Big Papa, which is very weird to me because P. Diddy apparently allegedly, according to the Cassie lawsuit, had Cassie call P. Diddy by what she called her grandpa. I don't really know what this is all about. I really don't know. But there was a lot of competition and the boys were teenage boys going through puberty on the road, probably all kinds of other issues. And they were fighting all the time with each other. I came across some clips in my research for this video. And one of the clips I came across was an interviewer asking the separate Backstreet Boys, what's the biggest fight they ever got into with each other? We have little arguments here and there, but never have a physical, 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 but never have a it was a little bit concerning to me that all of them said they had all been in fights with Nick, who was, again, the youngest member of the group whenever they first started. Worst fight, worst fight would be with Nick. Me and Nick, uh, behind the stage one time, got into it. I've gotten in a fight with everybody except Brian. I think it's easy to look back and remember the Backstreet Boys at the height of their fame. And by that point, all the boys kind of looked a little bit more like the same age. But in these first days of the Backstreet Boys, it was a stark and obvious difference between tiny little baby Nick and grown up ass Kevin. But in one of these clips that I found of one of these interviews, you have AJ telling the interviewer that the biggest fight he ever got into was with Nick. And he outlines what the fight was about. He said, Nick, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically he said, he said Nick wanted to go home. He was really young at the time. He was tired. He was tired of being on the road and he wanted to go home. And then AJ said that he called Nick a bunch of mean names, nasty names, something like that. And they got in a huge fight. And he basically told Nick, you know, it just sounds like you just don't want to work. It was over time off. Like when he was younger, when he was really trying to get back home into his family, and I called him a couple names and basically said, you know, you just don't want to work. But 14-year-old little kids are not supposed to want to work 12, 16-hour days, doing three gigs a day and all of that. That little clip did give me some insight into what I already suspected, that if one member of the band wanted for their own health, for their own safety, for their own benefit, to leave, to get out, then they would be pressured by the other members of the band, maybe because they loved them and wanted their brothers to stay with them. But I think much more than that, because if one member of the band went home, that would really mess up the whole tour and the whole production, the whole band, the whole image. Which translates to messing up the financial bottom line. I mean, that's just period. But Nick didn't just have to deal with that pressure of getting into literal physical fights with people for simply wanting to do the very natural human thing of wanting to go home. He also seemingly had a legal pressure. Let's say Brian Luttrell was, in fact, indeed, Nick's legal guardian. That means Brian was put in charge of making decisions for Nick because Nick could not make them for himself legally. What if Nick went up to Brian and said he wanted to go home? Is 18-year-old Brian going to say, yeah, sure, Nick, run on along? Probably not. And then even if Brian wasn't the legal guardian and it was just Nick's parents, Nick's parents had problems of their damn own. And I think that's one of the reasons why these particular boys got chosen. It's very common knowledge at this point that the music industry was choosing kids that were very young, very impressionable, and did not have strong home lives. I mean, Nick Carter's mom has been arrested at least twice that I've just accidentally became aware of because she was beaten up and doing domestic disputes on the dad, allegedly. So it is kind of easy to look at Nick Carter and the allegations that have stood up against him, even by his own family members, and think of him as a monster and as somebody who is just depraved and vile and disgusting. And to be honest, he might be. 
I personally do take the route of innocent until proven guilty. That's the mindset I like to have. But even if he is guilty of that in his adult life, he hadn't done any of that stuff as a child. And that's kind of what I'm talking about here. But my point isn't even necessarily about Nick Carter. My point is that this is not new. This boy band model has been around for a very long time, like specifically curating a band that is going to heighten the hormonal and emotional responses of little girls who are going to have the control over their parents' pocketbooks and then pitting those members of the band against each other to keep each other in line. It's literally the crabs in the barrel model and who's the person outside the barrel? Lou Pearlman types. The model is not new and it is not accidental. You see, Johnny Wright, similarly, did not just pop up out of nowhere. He spent the entirety of his life since he was 10 years old trying to get famous in any way that he could. He worked at radio stations, he was a DJ, he did all kinds of stuff before being a tour manager, road manager, talent manager. And one of the people that mentored Johnny early in his career had very strong connections to Motown Records. So whenever you have people like Ashley Parker Angel referring to Lou Pearlman as the Barry Gordy of our generation, it's not actually far off from the truth because Barry Gordy would have trained Maurice Starr. Is almost single-handedly responsible for pressure on parents to buy New Kids on the Block merchandise. He's their manager and creator, Maurice Starr. <laughs> Well, the parents don't mind, because every parent want to keep their kid happy. The writer and producer of all his acts' music, Star can't resist a cameo in a Rick West music video. I believe I can make you a star. Maurice Starr, the general, marches on. His objective in sight, to win the hearts and minds of America's young music fans. Who trained and mentored Johnny Wright? Who trained and mentored Lou Pearlman and Larry Rudolph? And if you follow that one line, that family tree down, you would be astonished. It's the most famous people in the world. For the last 50 years, we're all kind of incubated on the same model. Britney Spears herself was going to be in this boy band, girl band model. She was supposed to be in this band called Innocence, which was managed by guess who? Lou Pearlman and Justin Timberlake's mom? That's a story for another day, but we are going to be making a video about the Britney Spears origin story. We're gonna travel all the way back to 1990, 1992, and go back to the Mickey Mouse Club. We're gonna follow Britney's track of what she was doing during these years. We're gonna follow that line straight down to Jamie Lynn Spears and to Aaron Carter. And obviously a series like this would never be complete without mentioning the Backstreet Boys' biggest rival. So we're gonna be doing an entire dedicated video to NSYNC as well. I think I mentioned this earlier as well, but if I put together a video and I put every single fact and every single connection in it, it would just be a cluster bleep for lack of a better term. It would just be very confusing and very long. So there was a lot of stuff I was not able to get to in this video. So make sure that you do follow and turn on the notifications so that you can see the next videos in the series. But to wrap up today's video, really just want you to take away, Lou Pearlman did not act alone, but Lou Pearlman alone took most of the fall. Today, Johnny and Donna have turned their backs on Lou. They really try to separate themselves and to distance themselves from Lou's business management style. But the truth is they were there at those house parties blowing out candles and watching those boys drink too. This boy band model is nothing new. The abuse is nothing new. And using the courts and the legal loopholes to exact control over young children at an early and impressionable time in their life, also nothing new and certainly not accidental. So yeah, as you can see, we have a lot in the works. So make sure you are subscribed and you have your notification bell on. And even if you have subscribed, make sure you double check because sometimes you might've thought you subscribed and you're not subscribed. Um, you might have thought you did. Just check, double check, you know what I mean? For me, thanks. But yeah, I have to obviously have a lot of work to do between now and the next all of those videos, so I'm gonna get back to it. Thank you so much for checking out this video. In the meantime, facts ain't defamation. Love you, mean it, okay, bye. Hey, thank you very much. And that's the end of our show. And you made it, you made it, you made it, thank you. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Thank you for helping our youngsters here to spend some time.